Hello everyone, my name is Elijah David, Ministry of the Twelfth Hour Apostolic Sabbatarian and Congregation of Zion the Twelfth Hour. And in every hill Texas today is August 31, 2013. Uh, it is meeting 25, 2017. We will start our first service on this seventh day Sabbath with a song entitled The Love of the Yahweh. The love of Yahweh is greater far than tongue of pen can ever tell. Beyond the highest star and the richest here, the lowest hell. The guilty pair, the dumb that care, your greatest song to bear. His every child, he reconciled. from uh, Martin Luther clear on through. We're dealing with the parable of Matthew 20. First we're going to refer to a prayer thought taken from a few scriptures of uh, second, second Samuel chapter 7. Uh, it says in verse 1, And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, this is King David, and the uh, Yahweh had given him rest round about from all of his enemies, that the king said unto the Nathan the prophet, See now I dwell in the house of Cedar, but 
the ark of the Yahweh dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said unto the king, Go do all that is in thine heart, uh, for the Yahweh is with thee. And here's the prophet telling David, Go ahead and do all that is within your heart, for Yahweh is with thee. Uh, verse 4, And it came to pass that night that the word of Yahweh came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the uh, Yahweh, Shalt thou build me in house, build a, uh, me in house for me uh, to, to, to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of the Egypt. Now, how long has that been? It has been 500 years. 1500 BC, David took command of his ship in about 1000 BC. 1500 B.C. when Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Yahweh is telling him, actually Yahshua is the one communicating with David here. Remember he came to this earth uh, and, he, and he was born, uh, lived and died and resurrected and went back to heaven after uh, spent a 30 year, 33 and a half year period here. And he said, uh, foxes have uh, Holes to dwell in, and I guess the, the birds of heaven have uh, have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So all the thirty-three and a half years that he was here, nobody offered him a house except his his uh, father Joseph, and Joseph, of course, uh, supplied his house for thirty years. But I understand, and Yahshua stepped out on his own at the age of thirty and started his ministry. There was nobody offered him a house. Oh, he had the friendship and fellowship with uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He loved them dearly and spent some time in their home. Okay. So he says, Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, even unto this day, but I, I have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. And all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I command to feed my people sin, uh, or to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me in the house of cedar? David lives in the house of cedar, but now he... Now therefore uh, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, this is the Yahshua of the host. This is Yahshua talking, the son. I took thee from the sheep goat, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee, with the servant thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth, Over I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. Now I remember when I started out in 1970 with Gilead Center. As an Adventist, I moved all over the metroplex of the Fort Worth and Dallas area, three or four different places over a several year period of time, always looking for something better, something better, always having moved for one reason or another. And then when I met the Johnsons, I moved to their place out in Kermit, and uh, then when it come, uh, the time was up down there, I had to break up, and my wife and I had to move back to to the Austin, Texas area, and it's just constantly on the move. All right, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 11, and as uh, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people of Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also 
the Yeshua Telethi that he will make uh, that he will make in house. Now also the Yeshua Telethi that he will make the in house. Let's read that again. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, okay, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, have caused David to rest from all of his enemies, also the Yahshua telleth thee, also Yahshua is telling David, that he will make thee an house. Now this, this is important, that he will make David a house. Okay, let's uh, read again uh, verse uh, 12, or verse 11. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, this is 2 Samuel chapter 7. Okay, uh, and as uh, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also, the Yahweh telleth thee that he will uh, that he will make thee an house. So Nathan is passing the information on to David. He said, Yahweh telleth thee that he's going to make you a house. And when that day be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will sit up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Well, we know that kingdom uh, has been in uh, limbo for many, many years, uh, centuries. And now the, the kingdom of David has been raised up again. 2002 is raised up. And so now, who is this his kingdom he's going to establish in? His attitude for David. Uh, he shall build a house for my name. Now this he is antipical David. He shall build a house for my name. This is that spiritual house that Peter was talking about. Lively stones built up a spiritual temple. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul. Now, antipical King Saul was brought to Stephanie Johnson, 1972-2003. We're in the antitype of the fulfillment of this prophecy for the first time in the history of the world. So it says, but, I took, uh, but my mercy will, shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. So Yahshua is the one that put Brother Johnson away. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. So this is a, this is a promise. It's a prophecy. It's a promise made by an oath. That throne shall be established forever. We represent this everlasting kingdom of David. This little stone hewn out of the mountain without hands that strikes him on the feet, goes into a mountain, fills the whole earth. That's this kingdom of the everlasting kingdom of the David. According to all these words and according to unto all these uh, this vision, so did Nathan speak unto the David. Okay, now we're in the time period of the rod that speaks. The rod is speaking the same language unto the antipical David. Then went King David in and sat before the uh, Yahshua. And he said, Who am I, O Yahshua, uh, Messiah? All right, let's go back to the Father. That, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure is there. Well, let's just leave it at that. Then, then when uh, then went King David in and sat before the Yahshua, and he said, Who am I, O Yahshua, Messiah? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? 
Uh, and this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Yahweh Elohim. But thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner of the man, O Yahweh Elohim? And what can David say more unto thee? For thou, uh, Yahweh uh, Elohim, knoweth thy servant. For thy word's sake, and according unto thine own heart, hast thou done all these wonders, or great wonders, to make thy servant to know them. Wherefore thou art great, O Yahweh Elohim, for there is none like thee, neither is there any uh, uh, Elohim beside thee. According to all that we have heard with our ears, and what one nation the earth is like thy people, even like Israel? The question is being asked. And what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel? Whom Elohim went to redeem for a people unto himself, and to make him a name, and to do for you great things and terrible for thy land, before thy people which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt, from the nations and their gods. For thou hast confirmed unto thyself thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever. And thou, uh, Yahweh, art become their savior. Let's look at this. And thou, Yahshua, uh, art become their savior. And now, O Yahshua Messiah, the word thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. And let thy uh, name be magnified forever, saying, the, Yahweh, the Yahshua of the host, he is the king over Israel. And let the house of thy servant David be established before thee. Now this is a prophecy right now, and that question is already being requested right now. Let this house of David, I pray, personally to Yahshua, to be established before him uh, forever here in the Antioch. That's what we're in now. For thou, Yahshua, the host, uh, uh, Messiah of the Israel, has revealed, uh, for thou, O Yahshua, the host, Elohim of the Israel, Hast revealed unto thy servant, saying, I will build thee an house. Therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. And now, O Yahweh Elohim, thou art that Yahweh, and thy words be true. And thou hast promised his, uh, this faith, uh, this goodness unto thy servant. Therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever okay, before thee. For thou, O Yahweh Elohim, hast spoken it, and with thy blessing let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. Uh, that ends our prayer thought. Uh, take it from 2 Samuel chapter 7. The main points to be remembered is that, verse 24, For thou hast confirmed to thy, unto thyself, Thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever. That's why he has to choose uh, the everlasting kingdom of the David today. There's no stone here now the mountain without hands, striking the image on the feet, goes to the mountain fill the earth. Because he has confirmed to himself that Israel will be his people forever. I've been assured we're trying to blow the uh, Go to the ball game. They were trying to. They were trying to disinherit uh, their uh, everlasting kingdom, and they did. Finally, did. So it says uh, in, in verse 12, Second Samuel chapter seven, verse twelve: When thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy father. I will set up thy seed after thee. Well, I am of the seed of David. And we're at this time where this is the last seed to be raised up, to raise up this house of David. 
Uh, on that the 144th Adam will be the seed of David too, the Judah, the child of Judah, it certainly is. Which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. It's the kingdom that we're establishing right here today. Okay, let's go to my book. Uh, we're on page uh, 33. I'm uh, going to do a little review on the last uh, a little bit there on page 33. From the ending of the ninth parabolic hour, 1844 until the 12th, uh, uh, of the close of the probation, there are only three full hours. For the number of the hours, uh, symbolically, you notice that there is only enough probationary time from the year of 1844. From the year of 1844, that's the uh, answer to the ninth hour call until the end of the one movement. Uh, the seven, three hours. Okay. Well, we have a little uh, up, up, up waiting here to do on this. It says uh, this one movement is uh, the advanced person next to the last movement because. Uh, the everlasting kingdom of David that came out of the Adventist Church is the eighth movement. So there were two uh, there was two movements, literal, literal movements, uh, in the last three uh, parabolic hours. Right here, there was a movement right here starting in 1844 with the Advent. There was a movement here in 2002 starting with Mount Zion the twelfth hour, Elijah David at the head of it. Okay. Right here on your chart, here it is, number 7, Adventist, 1844-2002. Number 8, now it's the 12th hour. That's in this last parabolic hour. Okay. So now it says, uh, <coughs> So it says for the scripture, Revelation 10, 6 applies here. But there should be time, no longer, question for a uh, question. For the ninth hour call is only for the announcement of the two hours, 10th and the 11th. And for the 11th hour call makes up the last hour of the three hours. All right, here you are. First call, I mean the seventh call. 1844, Advent. Okay, and so now this, the second call is right here in 2002. So it says, uh, for the scripture, Revelation 10, 6 applies here that there should be time no longer. Now, Brother Sons, I mean, I'm beat the heart of us thinking and believing that. Uh, uh, he was answering that last call. He, he was uh, trying to show the address where Yahweh had passed them by, and that he had come on to the to the house of David, and and be told of, was actually uh, announcing the house of David with the rod message. And he's believing that he's answering this last call, and so he's applying that Revelation 10 6 to himself for a time. But he says time it should be no more. So he says uh, that there should uh, be time no long question for the ninth hour call is only for the announcing of the two hours, 10th and the 11th. See the ninth hour call right here for the 10th and the 11th. 11th, uh, 10th and 1844, the 11th and 1970, Boris Johnson had it. I worked that same uh, uh, 11th hour, uh, 11th parabolic hour with him. For 33 years. Okay. So he says, uh, for the 11th hour call, makes up the last hour of the three. Here it is. 11th hour call come right here at 12. 
at the beginning of, of the twelfth hour. Uh, therefore, there are two movements this side of the year 1844. Uh, the ninth hour movement is your uh, fourth group of uh, Adventists. That's the fourth group. Matthew 20, verse 5, call it the ninth hour. William Miller was the third group called uh, at the sixth hour, and that's in Matthew 20, verse 5, as well. Okay. So, uh, and uh, the eleventh hour call is with the fifth movement. Okay. So the eleventh hour call now is with the fifth movement. Actually, it's with the uh, fifth group of laborers, that is, it's called out. Uh, to work. That's the last call. There's only five groups of laborers that the call of Matthew 20 calls for to go out and work in the vineyard, starting with Moses and his children in 1500 BC and ending with uh, David, Elijah David, as antipical David, answering the last call. Matthew 20, verse 6. Well, let's do a little review of what we just read here. Uh, maybe we can make it a little bit more clear. Mark the following point with the carriage. From the ending of the ninth parabolic hour, 1844, right here. Starting with number 10. He knows that there is only enough probationary time for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. From the year 1844 to the end of the Seventh Movement. The seventh movie starts here in 1844, and it ends right here in 2002. The seventh dominion, the seventh movement. Okay. And so there's only a probation here closed for the Seventh Day Adventist Church right here in 2002, when their seventh uh, period was up, when their seventh dominion was up. I was part of that seventh dominion. In 1972-2003, I was part of that, and uh, I was called out when the judgment started at the house of Yahweh. I was called out in 2002. I came to the judgment and uh, advanced into the eighth dominion, the twelfth hour. So now probation uh, is closed for the Adventist Church. But uh, the seating started for the 144,000. And the, the, the 144,000 are the only ones that, that escaped the judgment in the Adventist Church. Their probation uh, closed at the end of the judgment for the dead. And Sister Christ says in the Great Convert, uh, she saw that it would be a, a change from the dead to the living, how soon it would, uh, in the future it was from her, she didn't know, but she said there's going to be a change from the dead to that. And then she said, there a, she said there was a closing work for the Adventist Church. Now that closing work came in 2002 to come in Texas with Verlis Johnson, the angel of the seventh candlestick, uh, the, the inspirational voice piece for the Adventists, the last prophet of the Adventist Church, whenever he betrayed them and uh, apostatized, and that brought the end of the Adventist Church. But it's, Closing out the judgment of the dead and, and uh, advancing it to a new leadership, a new movement with a new message and with the new seal, the seventh seal, and starting the judgment of the living with Elijah David. Starting to raise up the foundation of many generations of the David that had fallen down. Alright? And now it says, uh, so there's no more time, there's no more probationary time for the heaven. They had 158 years from 1844 to 2002, and that's all that was, they were given. And if they had another 158 years, they'd, they'd have been worse off than they were then. Okay. So it says, uh, for the scripture, uh, Revelation 10, 6 applies here. The B.T. Hall says, applies here for the Adventists, for their probation closes at the end of uh, uh, closing out the judgment of the dead in 2002. B.T. Hyde have had no way of knowing that. He only could write it uh, as a prophecy projected in the future for its future fulfillment. 
is only for the announcing of the 2 hour, 10th and 11th for the 11th hour call. Right here, at the end of this 11th hour, 2002, and it's right here. Okay. That makes up the last hour of the three hours. Therefore, there are two movements this side of the year of 1844. The ninth hour call movement with the fourth group of laborers, Matthew 20, verse 5. And then your eleventh hour call laborers, the fifth group, Matthew 20, verse 6, being called out here starts the general living. And Elijah, actually, and typically Elijah, Malachi 4, 5, is what brought the end of the judgment for the dead, with the Adventist shirt. The records in heaven will show that. For every movement that the Elohim has called into the existence since uh, the world began went just so far. And when it sent a message or a new light upon his word, the leaders rejected it and necessity gave birth unto a new movement. So who was the last leader of the Adventist Church that rejected the last message of righteousness by faith in the blood of the Yahshua? Huh. Go to Stephanie Johnson, 2002, Kermit Texas, Gilead Center, third feeding pastor for the Seventh-day Adventist, third step of the junior mind movement for the Seventh-day Adventist, as antitypical King Saul, passing his mantle on to antitypical King David. Okay. <clears throat> or if uh, the leaders in the Elohim's congregation at the present time should accept of the 11th hour call, it would be out of the ordinary. But should they reject it, Elohim cannot start a new movement, for there is time no longer. Well, no, actually, Vicky uh, Hollip is right. Now let's explain something else. Movements are when you are given messages to, uh, to do seed sowing, and then cometh harvest. And what did that movement of the Adventists produce, the Seventh Movement? From 1844 to 2002, it produced a harvest. So their work wasn't in vain. They did exactly what prophecy uh, or, or ordained that they should do. Seed sowing. Seed sowing. They sowed the seed of the seven-day Sabbath all over the world for 158 years, kept it ever before the world. And that's all they're supposed to do. And what was that seed? That was a spelt which is of the wheat family, and that represented the seventh-day Sabbath, that grain of spelt. In 1844, it was called a grain of doctrine. It was a grain that you could cook, no doubt, and eat or uh, in some form or another. It's a cereal. So Adventists had six grains of doctrine because they inherited the uh, uh, all of those six grains of doctrine from the reformers that went before them, starting with Martin Luther. And he had the, he had the doctrine uh, represented by the wheat grain. Spelt is a of the wheat family that represented the seven day seven. So when Ellen G. White took the helm in 1844, she ended up with six grains of doctrine that was found in Ezekiel's 4 9 vessel. And she needed seven grains of doctrine to break the, to make the two wave loaves come to full maturity at Pentecost to bake the two uh, to the two loaves of bread that represents the twelve the two houses of Israel with the twelve tribes she had to have a seventh grain of doctrine which is the mustard seed Matthew 13 31 that was given to me now uh, I've added the seventh grain of doctrine to those six grains that was given Ellen G. White and now uh, the, the seed is going to be sown. It's already been sown. It's going to bring forth the harvest of the whole world's remnant and all nations, kindred, tongue, and people. And it's going to bring also forth the resurrection, cure back to Adam. That's how powerful this doctrine is. That's represented by that grain of the mustard seed. And it joins the other six grains of doctrine which it has already. When it comes to full maturity now, you're going to have the two wave loaves of bread that were waved at the Passover. And it took them from Passover to Pentecost to bake and rise and bake. 
and bring the maturity of the two houses of Israel, the two great kingdoms, Ephraim and uh, Judah. Ephraim represented by Joseph and Judah represented by David. And now when uh, Antipical Joseph comes back and joins Antipical David, then you're going to find out that that's what joins the two houses together. And, uh, and uh, uh, our Savior Yeshua the Messiah, he represents Antipical Joseph. Joseph was a type of Yahshua down in Egypt under the Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh represented Yahweh the Father. So there you have it. Yahshua is coming back. He's already back and visibly as Antipical Joseph. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we're going to continue on our reading. It says, uh, for the new movements, uh, uh, generally start, uh, starts uh, with a handful of the people and require years for the developing, and after a time, corruption sets in. Consequently, he could never finish his work on the earth with such a problem. For the words of the Master, figuratively, uh, be clear that the leadership in the movement called in the year of 1844 will reject the 11th hour message. The 11th hour message, <coughs> Brother Johnson started with the 11th hour message in 1970, with the full restoration of the sanctuary. And sure enough, the Adventists rejected that message. They rejected it for 33 years. That's what discouraged Rudolf Johnson so much, and that's what caused him to apostatize overall. Because he never, he never utilized the sanctuary service restored for, for the purification of Gilead Center, so consequently he had no way else, no other way to go but to apostatize and take his apostatized flock with him, except those that escaped the judgment. And there's only three of us that, that escaped out of that. Okay. But it says, uh, but it says for the new movements, they generally start with a handful of people, and it started with us, which was the third step of the genuine movement of Adventists. 1970, Gideon Center, Brother Johnson had that up with only a handful of people. He probably had less than uh, 24 people. He had one family outside himself. I believe. So uh, it says, uh, and after time, corruption sits in. Uh, well, okay, corruption certainly did sit in at Gilead Center. After a time, it certainly did, fulfilling exactly what the uh, Holiday is saying here. Consequently, he could never finish his work on the earth with such a problem. For the words of the Master figuratively declare that the leadership in the movement called in the year of 1844, okay, we'll reject the 11th hour message. Well, uh, we need to upgrade that. Ruthie Hall says, the leadership in the movement called in the year of 1844 will reject. Well, the leadership that's called in 1844 was Ellen G. White, and she was a prophetess with, with the Office of Inspiration. And if she was allowed to live on uh, to this very end, she would not reject this, this movement. For she is going to be resurrected to finish her work in this great movement of the Eighth Movement, the Eighth Domain. She died in the Seventh Domain. She will be resurrected in the Eighth Domain to take up her work anew. And she will recognize it. Showing that she did not, she would never, never have rejected the message of, of Antipathy David and this movement. But, a uh, general conference leadership that formed in 1863, yes, they will reject this message. And they, they have already. They, and they caused the Adventists to reject every message sent to them after they were formed in 1863. Keep in mind that L.G. Wright's husband, James Wright, was the president of the general conference no less than three times. 
between 1863 and 1881, showing that he was on the side of those ring readers of the apostasy uh, when it was all over with. <clears throat> so it says, for the words of the Master, it figuratively declared that the leadership and the movement called in the year of 1844 will reject the uh, 11th hour message. Okay, so the General Conference rejected the uh, they rejected the uh, tenth hour message that Jones and Wagner brought in 1890. Russia's by faith. It was nothing but uh, the end cap of Martin Luther's message of Russia's by faith. 390 years apart, fulfilling the prophecy of Ezekiel 4, where Ezekiel laid on his left side for 390 days for the iniquity of the house of Israel. Well, the house of Israel started with Martin Luther, 1500 AD. The ten tribes. But the gathering of the ten tribes. That 390 year prophecy in Ezekiel 4 was for the gathering of the ten tribes. And that, that's what the Adventist Church represented from 1500 to 1890. Where right. well, it says, Those who were about to be hired were standing idle. Now, uh, now that is, it was not uh, those that were whom he hired. Mm -hmm. So when the 11th hour started winding down to come to this end, 2002, those that were at work, uh, he didn't hire them. He only hired, hired those that were made idle. Those that were made idle is the ones that he kicked out of the church, Roger Johnson. Roger Johnson was also idle at this time. He was, he was uh, in 2002. He worked very hard uh, in 1907 for the first seven years. And then he started winding down. And by the time he came to your uh, 12th parabolic hour in 2002, he was completely wound down. So he was standing idle too. We were all standing idle. Okay. But the ones that Yahshua came in hard in 2002 wasn't the one that had occupied and were in charge of the 11th hour. <laughs> so, so he says, for if there is a time for a new, if there is no time for a new movement, you know, uh, there is time then for the harvest of the world's movement. No, there is no more time for uh, the Adventist movement, no, 2002. But there is time for the harvest movement. One short hour. Okay. So it says, let's, let's reread this now and put this in the policy sense. For if there is time uh, for a new movement, which there is, then there is but one solution to the perfection problem, that is to separate the wheat from the tares. Now you see what I did right here? I took out that no. For Vichy Hara put that no in there, and I put the, for there is time for a new movement. And so when that new movement starts, it's signalized by the separating of the wheat from the tares in the Adventist church, starting in Ezekiel 9. Okay. So there is time for a new movement. And I just changed that on my, in my book. And there is but one solution unto the perfection problem, problem, and that is to separate the wheat, the remnant, the 144,000, from the tares by smiting, uh, by the smiting of the class who are with the controlling of the work and keeping of the Elohim's people in the bondage of the sin. Therefore, the enemies of the Elohim are taken out of the way by the five men of the Ezekiel 9. Okay. For well, this subject is made clear in the shepherd rod by the one. Okay. Now here we have the last first and the first last. For well, the coming back unto our text, a measure of the wheat for a penny and three measures of the barley for a penny. Uh, Revelation 6 6. Why uh, is the wheat mentioned first? Now it says, uh, 
part is the wheat mentioned first. Folks, uh, pay close attention to this because uh, I have gone over this many, many, many times to get it clarified in my mind so I can explain it to you. It says, why is a wheat means inverted? And the brother asked, why not to reverse? Why three times as much barley for a penny? For one of the wheat, or why not to reverse? For the scriptures are perfect and no flaw can be found in them. Therefore, there must be a reason for this order of the arrangement as well as for the quantity of the each cereal. For the uh, barley ripens much earlier than the wheat. Now keep in mind that you can plant barley any time uh, of, the, uh, of the season that is to be planted then to make it uh, represent a first uh, fruit harvest all over the world. You can sow it in the mountains, you can sow it in the lowlands, you can sow it to where the barley grain will come off just right before the Passover. It's a very hardy grain and uh, it will, it will uh, be, uh, and, it, and it has been planted to, to do that very thing. And when it comes off in the early spring, the priests always go out and get a handful of barley to use it for a wave sheaf offering to start the Passover. Okay. Or actually to, uh, to end the Passover week. Therefore, those hired first are with the representation by the barley. Otherwise, the symbol could not be perfect. For the barley then represents the Jewish nation as they were hired first. Naturally, the wheat must represent the one's call at the end of the eleventh hour, and that was the one that actually the Seventh-day Adventist Church of uh, Now, here's another new breaking news. When the Adventist Church came to their close in 2002, in the Judgment of the Dead, they also closed out fleshly Israel's dominance over the kingdom from 1500 B.C. by uh, by Moses. I'm talking about fleshly Israel's dominance over the kingdom from 1500 B.C. until 2002. The advent of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Brothers Johnson working in the last, uh, the, the next to the last hour of the, the 11th hour, he brought the close of day for fleshly Israel because he too was carnal and represented fleshly Israel. Spiritual Israel had, has always been represented by the antipical Jacobs. And spiritual Israel never showed up until 1970 in the camp of Brother Stephen Johnson in the 11th hour. Spiritual Israel, the antipical Jacobites, worked alongside with the, uh, the, the fleshly carnal antipical Esau, the spiritual twin brother of Elijah David from 1972-2002. Brother Johnson is antipical Esau closed out fleshly Israel's sojourn for a 3,500 year period. That fleshly carnal Israel had had a stranglehold grasp uh, I mean, a uh, hold on the, on the Adventist, I mean, on, on the spiritual Israel. In other words, the, the mighty Esau's have had the, the, the uh, stranglehold on the Jacobs that were to emerge. Okay. It's been a, a long odyssey. The saga is there, has been made. Okay. The legacy has, uh, been made for the for the fleshly Israel. From the time she was called uh, in 1500 BC until 2002, she was always in charge 
of every movement for, for, for Israel every, uh, from 1844 until the cross, that is, when Yeshua came and set up the disciples to succeed them to close out the Old Testament period. And so now he calls the disciples, 144,000, to close out the New Testament period for fleshly Israel. You get the point? <clears throat> Okay, therefore, those hired first are with the representation by the body. Okay, so Brother Johnson represented the body. He was hired first in 1970. I was hired second. But in the 11th hour, so all this flesh to Israel, from the first hour through the 11th hour, they had to work in each hour respectively in their time. And uh, always flesh and evil was hard first to work in each one of these hours. Their spiritual twin brother Jacob would always end up bringing the close of each one of these hours that they worked in. The reformers brought the close in 1500 AD, starting with Martin Luther. Martin Luther worked in the fifth parabolic hour. Right here, the fifth parabolic hour. Okay, John Wesley, his succession in 1543 in the 5th Parabolic Hour. John Wesley, 1725, the Methodist, with the grain of doctrine uh, of grace, uh, worked in the 5th uh, Parabolic Hour for the Methodist. The Methodists had the to finish out the 5th Parabolic Hour, 1725 on until 1810 when their successor, Alexander Campbell, okay, succeeded them and started and opened up the sixth hour and brought the fifth parabolic hour to close in 1810. And there you had Alexander Campbell, the Baptist, then occupying the sixth parabolic hour with, with the training of Martin, uh, William Miller during the sixth par parabolic hour. And when William Miller got his training in the six parabolic hours over in 1833, then William Miller took charge of the seventh, eighth, and the ninth parabolic hours from 1833 to 1844. Okay. <clears throat> so therefore, you always had spiritual men bringing the close of these parabolic hours, even though they were part of fleshly Israel. You always have a remnant. Whenever you have any kind of a movement underfoot in Israel, you always have a remnant. You always have two classes there of wheat and tares. Okay. So, uh, in other words, in 18, uh, 1930, when V.T. Hall took the helm right here, in the midst of the 10th hour, between 10 and 11, 1930, who was his adversary? No doubt it was the General Conference people of the Seventh-day Adventists that was his predecessor. But who, who did, uh, was raised up in his midst to be his successor, be to his successor, that became an adversary? Ben wrote So we got to Rod Perry. He was there training uh, to be an adversary, and he ended up being an adversary. Brother Johnson was training under Ben Roden during that time, to, say, to uh, get his qualification to head up the 11th hour and, say, and succeed Ben Roden. So Brother Johnson was a spiritual one during the 10th hour that succeeded the, 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 the fleshly, fleshly carnal one, the antipathy Ishmaelite Ben Roden. But Brother Johnson emerged as the antipathy Esau in the very beginning, very sincere in what he uh, was called to do. He knew what he was called to do. He started off spiritual, but he ended up carnal and uh, very, uh, very uh, uh, fleshy. Okay. Therefore, those hard first are with the representation by the brothers. So all those that hard first at the beginning of each one of these parabolic hours, the first 11 parabolic hours from 1500 B.C., starting with Moses and Shilohim, and everyone is hard to occupy work in these hours, they always had a succession that brought those hours to a close. Always had a spiritual succession that brought each one of these hours to a close. 
that they were hardened. But keep in mind, those that hardened the first 11 parabolic hours from 1500 B.C. to 2000, uh, 1970, they represent, was represented by the barley grain. In other words, barley grain represents the first of the first fruits in the, in the, uh, when you start the harvest in the sanctuary. So always those that was the elder that headed up each one of these parables, God represented by the barley, first of the first fruits. But the wheat ends up representing uh, the end of the first fruits. They're the ones that are baked to maturity and come to purification, not the barley. The barley is the leavening that goes in those two wave loads to cause them to rise and to come to full maturity and to be fully baked at Pentecost. That's another thing we need to consider and remember. There's so many things, folks, that dovetails into all of this. <clears throat> and no doubt, I spent 43 years uh, learning all of these things. And it took every bit of it to be able now to congeal this stuff down into a compacted prophecy and then open it up to you folks here and the 12th third body down. <clears throat> Okay, therefore, those hard first are with the representation of the barley, otherwise the symbol could not be perfect. For the barley then represents the Jewish nation. I'm talking about the carnal, fleshly Jewish nation. And so, uh, when we say Jewish nation, we're talking about the nation of Judah. Because you don't use that word Jewish nation for the ten tribes. You call them an Israelite nation. But when you get down to Judah having her own nation, which she did, she was she was separated from the ten tribes. 721 BC, ten tribes went into captivity in the Assyrians, among the Assyrians in the north. Judah went into captivity under Nebuchadnezzar in the south, 120 or one years later. I believe it was about that night. So now, the Jewish nation has been in charge now of Israel ever since. But they came out of captivity and they emerged at Jerusalem to occupy Jerusalem, their home place. And they have been in charge then of the great nation of Israel. As they were hard first, naturally, the wheat must represent the ones called at the end of the 11th hour, 2003 the fifth group, Matthew 20, verse 6, for the scriptures are marvelous with the perfection. Well, we're getting right along, folks. we got about two or three minutes left here. It looks like. Well, actually, we just, uh, we're really at the close of our study for this hour. We are just get our song going now and, and bring this to a close. And, uh, then we'll resume this uh, on our next study. This brings the close of our study this hour. Uh, you can contact us at the 11th hour call, that's number one. Click on our audio archives here, this message is more. We're going to close now with a song entitled, Will Yahshua uh, Find Us Watching When He Comes? When Yahshua come to reward His servants, whether it be noon or night, they flow to him, they find us watching with your lamps all trimmed and bright. Oh, can we say we are ready, brother, ready for the soul's bright home? Say, will he find you and me still watching? Waiting, watching when the king shall come. If at the dawn of the early morning he shall call us one by one, when to the king we restore our talents, then the answer is well done. Have we been true? He'll trust he left us Do we seek to do our best? If in our hearts there is not 
can give us. We shall have a glorious rest. The citadel and the king finds marching. In his glory they shall say, If he shall come at the dawn of midnight, Will he find us watching there? Or oh, can we say we're ready, brother, Ready for the soul right home? Say, will he find you and me still watching? Waiting, watching when the king shall come.